while many of you were writing exams or, you know, running to the library. Our PhDs were busy doing something completely else. The first SBE Science Lab. Wondering what it's like? Welcome back. In the first SB Science Lab, and if you're wondering what it's all is about, it's an event where, unlike a seminar, researchers do effort to explain whatever they're doing in human words. You know, plain English. In a fun and energetic way. So the writers of those long and lengthy articles make it understandable for normal people like, you know, you and me. Ladies and gentlemen, the very first speaker of tonight, Matthijs Korevaar! Who thinks housing is expensive? Who thinks housing in London is expensive? Probably everyone. So how did I get all this data together? What we are more or less doing is that lots and lots of historical studies that are combined, going to archives, collecting data. These are all kinds of rental records. I've seen many of them and in total we have 250,000 rental records such that we can spend rents all the way from 1500 to 2016. The reason why you guys here are all spending so much on rents is not necessarily because they have gotten a whole lot more expensive. Oh, there we go, yes. Because that is not so much if we look at Belgium, but it's mostly because you consume a lot more, you care more about it, you want space for yourself. And that is the main reason why we're investing more and more and more in rents, why we're spending more and more. And why all of you should not really say that the reason that I spend so much on rents is because they are so expensive, it's just because you want to consume a lot. And of course London is expensive. We had the Antwerp story. If demand is high, rents are going to be high, but in the end it's going to be your consumption. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you asked because I wanted to point out some, to clarify some things that Matthias said. Like, as I learned in history back in the schools, I, I think, I hear that we, sorry, Spain didn't go and conquer or invade any country. We went there to share our knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and those ships were not full of cannons, but actually love and like Spanish ham and all of this stuff. So just wanted to clarify. You don't use this kind of invasion things when you. <laughs> what am I doing here? I think about two weeks ago, Enric, who is there, asked me if I wanted to present. They were lacking people, so... <laughs> so, uh, what is reciprocity? You can get a definition from the Oxford Dictionary. Respond to a gesture or an action by making a corresponding one. So, here's a decision that people are facing. There's an employer choosing a wage. Then, uh, if the employer offers a high wage, what do you do? If the, offer, if the employer offers a low wage, what do you do? So here are two options, okay? Offer a high wage, choose a high effort, offer a low wage, you destroy the office, okay? <laughs> so second result, only for the American experiment. So only the workers who receive below or equal to their self-stated fair wage, they reciprocate. So what we find is almost strictly negative reciprocity, or at least what we interpret as negative reciprocity. Uh, and here's the patterns of reciprocity for short and long-term workers. I hope it's clear. Here's the effort, the wage, that's the fair wage. Pattern is different. What you have here is that if you meet the fair wage, you get a higher effort than if you don't meet it. But if you go below and below the, wage, the fair wage, they're not going to punish you more. Here's the kind of data of output we get from uh, our data. So here is just, if you look, it's just slightly angry. It's, it's really neutral. Okay. To conclude. Uh, Yes, uh, it's the first time I'm using paint in a presentation, so LaTeX has gone, uh, and now it's paint. I give her a warm uh, applause, Judith! I would like to introduce you to the world of management and leadership. If it's interesting for the firm to have good supervisors, how can we incentivize them to do their job? Uh, invest in their skills and put effort in the development of their subordinates or PhDs. Employees are um, lazy and actually don't want to work like our little animal friend here. So the first one is actually, you get financially rewarded if you put sufficient effort into your subordinates. Um, second finding is, if uh, you are willing to invest in your skills, 
um, you will have a high likelihood of promotion, which also makes sense again, because of course we want to have the good leaders at the top of our university or firm. In the public context, managers show less openness to employees' ideas than when employees speak up in private. And the underlying psychological mechanism in that, it's basically threat. What is even worse, as you can imagine, we female, we always suffer. And this effect is even stronger for female employees. So you just <laughs> brought an additional speaker onto the stage. So I, I, I immediately turned to the jury and we, we, we just found out speaking oh. in public by women is not really good. So therefore the jury consistency <laughs> of men. So, uh, but what do you say about that? Just cheating here, like bringing an additional speaker out of the blue. I find it very offensive for all females. <laughs> that two of them should represent one person. <laughs> so apparently it's very important to watch yourself. Also in healthcare it's very important, but in healthcare it's actually an undervalued activity. Uh, it is, for instance, important for uh, bedridden patients. Those are patients that are too ill or too injured to leave the bed. And they are washed in the bed, usually, in the traditional ways with water and soap, with uh, wash basins, uh, towels and washing mitts. And we replace it all with one package of swash in this case. This is the washing without water concept. Uh, this is one package that can be used for one body wash of one bedridden patient with the aim to study the effects of washing without water compared to the traditional bed bath on outcomes that matters most to patients and uh, nurses. So it's a very practical uh, research question actually. And the setup, how I want to study that, it is this three-phase setup. But then I want to publish my qualitative study in a marketing journal and only one, uh, uh, the, the question, what are the uh, most important outcomes according to these actors is not enough. You need to have a theoretical contribution, right? So that, that's when I first thought, well, hmm, a PhD, okay. Um, but in the end, we found the concept of balanced centricity, which says that a system is in balance if all actors' needs are met. So if the patient, in this case, the relative, but also the nurse is satisfied, and the, then you have balanced centricity, value is delivered for all. Um, and that is what I want to know besides the, what they think is most important. They rolled the dice already five times and we still have <laughs> And now the so, very important moment I just tell you the procedure. <laughs> Stalin said. <laughs> it's not important who is voting, it's important who is counting the votes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we now first we decided for two finalists, which were the finalists. <laughs> You see how good this was uh, practice, huh? <laughs> The two finalists of tonight's Science Slam are Matthijs, please stand forward. <laughs> and the second finalist, I should say finalist, is Judith and Sophia. <laughs> And then now the important moment. Who of them are going to win the jury? 50 euros. Is it going to, uh, to Ibiza or is it going to special beer? The winner of the Science Slam 2016 SPE are the girls. <laughs> So now you know what happens on the other side of things. Having that said, that's all the time we got for today. If you're a student, I hope your exams went well. And if you're a staff member, good luck grading all of them. To both of you, be reasonable on those complaints. And as always, I'll catch you later.